family. One man's family is dedicated to the mothers and fathers of the younger generation and to their bewildering offspring. Today transcribed, we present Chapter 10, Book 72, entitled, The Family Must Make Its Decision. It is 10 o'clock on a bright Saturday morning early in December, and along Seacliff Drive in San Francisco, as on many another street the whole world over, four-handed people are beginning their Christmas preparations. Fanny Barber, for instance, sitting at the desk in the library in the family home, is addressing Christmas cards, while Father Barber, in his big chair nearby, finishes with the morning paper. Fanny looks up from the envelope she is addressing. If you have anything in particular to do, Henry, you could put stamps on these envelopes. Yes. I'm going to have the cards tied in neat bundles and all ready to mail by the 18th of December. This is one year I'm going to have things ready ahead of time. Yes. What did you say, Henry? Where is Paul? Oh, I don't know, Henry. He went out. Yeah. Didn't go to the airfield this morning, did he? Didn't mention the airfield, did he? Henry, I'm not going to discuss Paul with you anymore. If you want to discuss Paul, find someone else to talk to. Yes, sir. Now, this is the Christmas season. Well, almost, anyway. I want to begin to feel some Christmas spirit. Yeah, I'd like to feel the Christmas spirit, too, Fred. Uh, nobody likes Christmas any better than I do, but this year with Nicholas in England and Claudia keeping to herself in this strange fashion and Clifford out looking for a job, which he's never going to find unless he widens his horizon, and Paul enamored of an upstart widow in the neighborhood, why, how is anyone going to feel any Christmas spirit? Henry, I'll my pocket and work in some other room if you don't stop. Can I even explain why I can't get the Christmas spirit? You simply don't realize that every remark you make finally becomes a complaint about Paul. Yes, yes, sir. Very well. Now, about Christmas presents. Let me talk to you a moment about some of the things I'd like to buy. For you. And about time. Very well. Now, there's Nicolette. I want to get something very nice indeed for Nicolette this year just as though she were actually a member of the family. Now, if you and I gave her such a gift together, well, that would be proper, if any. Mm-hmm. You see my reasoning. She, Paul, has treated her so shabbily, and our gift was, must make her feel that you and I, at least, still want her as a member of the family. Yes, she would have made a wonderful mother for Paul's children. Naturally, she doesn't realize yet that Paul is spending every free moment with this Christine Frohm, Freulich, Abbott woman, whatever her name is. Yeah, uh, uh, Fanny, where are you going? I'm moving to another room. Here. My mom, Dad. Hey, anybody home? Uh, in here, Jack. In the library. Okay. Oh, golly, what nice, brisk December weather. Hey, swell fire. And Christmas cards, huh, Mom? That's great. Well, there's not going to be any last-minute rush. Not this year. <laughs> Good for you. We haven't even started yet. Haven't ordered them even. With presents for six daughters to think of, we'll be lucky if we get around to buying anything for the rest of the family. What do you want, Dad? Huh? What do you want for Christmas? For myself? Hmm? I wouldn't ask anything but to have my family here, around me. To have their interests here. That's all I ask. Have you seen Paul this morning? Nope. Say, Mom, uh, what I came over for, have you got any cube sugar? Why, well, I think so. You know those little half cubes? Betty will take long cubes, of course, but she'd rather have the little ones. <laughs> She's got three friends coming in for tea, and she thinks little cubes look better than loose sugar. Well, I'll get you some, Jack. Hey, Mom, you upset about something? No, dear. You feeling all right now? Of course, Jack. Well, something's kind of haywire over here. Hey, hey, it isn't because you mind if I borrow things from you once in a while like this, is it? Why, Jack, we love to have you run in for things, don't we, Henry? Yeah, in fact, it's getting so. You're the only one I get a chance to talk to. Clifford looking for a job, and goodness knows where Paul is. I'll be right back, dear. Thanks, Mom. If Paul would... Well, only... looks like I'm going to have some Christmas money, Dad. Yep, going to be a disbursement of fees on the 15th down at the office, and I might get six or $700 for my share all in a lump. Yes, oh, well, that's fine. I was just saying to your mother, we ought to do something especially nice for Nicolette this year, considering the way that Paul is behaving and all. Uh-huh. 
I hope that you and Betty thoroughly appreciate her. Oh, sure. The kids love her and she loves them. Oh, Jack, I'm sorry. I don't have any cube sugar at all. Oh. Well, I might run over to Hazel's. Of course. Why don't you go with him, Henry? The air would do you good. Huh? Sure. Come along, Dad. I got a lot of stuff I want to tell you about. Very well, Jack. I haven't seen Hazel and her family since yesterday afternoon. And as a matter of fact, there's a thing or two I'd like to discuss with you. To Hazel and Dan from Mother and Father Barber. What's that, Margaret? It's an old gift card from last year. Oh, yes. That was on the chafing dish they gave us. Oh, here's some Christmas wrapping from last year we didn't use. Good. Smooth it out. Hmm, gee, I'm glad we're getting started early. Your grandmother never is rushed, so I decided to start the same day she did. Maybe we, too, can be calm and collected this Christmas. You know what's best about it? What? It makes you feel Christmassy for a whole month. Shall I wrap this one? Oh, better let me wrap them. Okay. Does it seem about 20 million years between Christmases to you? As a matter of fact, it certainly does not. It doesn't? <laughs> Funny thing, Margaret. Children and grown-ups seem to live in a different time dimension or something. Huh? At your age, time drags horribly. The school year, goodness, it lasted forever, and from Christmas to Christmas is, as you say, about 20 million years. You used to feel that way, too? Oh, yes, but no more. Suddenly, time began to speed up. When will it begin for me? Soon enough. One of these days, you'll hardly get the leftover wrappings from one Christmas put away, and it'll be December again. Oh, golly, that must be wonderful. I'm not so sure. Oh, uh -oh doorbell. See who it is. Huh? Okay. Let me know if I'm to hide any presents. Oh, it's Grandfather and Uncle Jack. Oh, put the book away. What about Uncle Jack's scar? It's wrapped. He won't see it. Let him in. Hi, Grandfather. Hi, Uncle Jack. Well, look here, Dad. Christmas stuff all over this house, too. <laughs> Hello. Come on in. Mom sure started something, it seems to me. Huh, Margaret, huh? that's a pretty sweater. Thanks, Grandfather. I was telling Jack Hazel, I think we should all do something especially nice for Nicolette this year. For reasons, uh, you, you know, you, you understand, Hazel. Yes, Father. Look, here's the car from the chafing dish you gave Mom and Dan last year. Huh? Well, yes. uh, where is Daniel? And, and Pinky and Hank, where are they all? Oh, they were off to the Sky Ranch early this morning. Huh? Thought he had a special airmail from Nicky. Things he wanted looked after at Sky Ranch. Honestly, with Dan's business affairs and the errands for Claudia, it's getting so I never see him. Oh, not that he shouldn't help Nicky and Claudia, but he's always just leaving for somewhere. Yes, he isn't the only one, Hazel. Consider your brother poor. Why, it's as if Paul weren't living with us anymore. The family home's little more than a bedroom. Why, Hazel... Uh, Dad. He doesn't actually... Dad, pardon me? Huh? Pardon me just a second. Hazel, have you got any cube sugar? Cube sugar? Well, I think so. Margaret, go out in the kitchen. Oh, and... I know where it is. Third shelf. You don't have to tell me. I know where it is. Right, Paul had dinner with us, so let's see. Uh, well, perhaps it was a week ago Monday. I know. Isn't it dreadful how busy everybody is? Last week, Dan and I were planning fried chicken. Everybody in the family was hungry for fried chicken. Then suddenly something came up at the Sky Ranch, so we bundled in the cars and went up with Claudia and took the chicken with us. Yes, yes. And then we had such a helter-skelter time of it, we ate at a hamburger stand in Redwood City, and I forgot, and left that uncooked chicken in the Sky Ranch refrigerator. We simply drove off and left it there. Yes, yes. I year after year, I hope for a period when we can quiet down and settle into our homes and enjoy the fireside, but there's always something. Now, if Paul... Uncle Jack! Hey, is that your cube sugar? Yeah, that's all. Just two cubes out of the whole box. Oh, Jack, I'm sorry. Well, after all, it's kind of silly. Granulated sugar tastes just as good in a cup of tea. Well, how about Claudia? She's almost sure to have some. Might do just that. You want to walk along with me, Dad? You didn't give me a chance to tell you about those cases. Uh, no, no, you tell me some other time, Jack. I I'll chat with Hazel for a moment. Uh, uh, Margaret, why don't you go with me? Eh? That's a good girl. But I'm helping to wrap presents. Well, we won't wrap anymore until after lunch, dear. Run along with Uncle Jack if you want to. Sure, come on. I'll tell you things you won't believe about a man with six beautiful daughters. <laughs> okay, Uncle Jack. You better wear a coat. Oh, no, this sweater's warm enough. You better wear a coat. But, Mom, the sweater. Wear a coat, Margaret, please. Okay, Mom, okay. Oh, Uncle Jack, you ready? Bye, Dad. Bye, Hazel. Oh, um, Hazel, keep one thing in mind, will you? Yes, what's that? One thing I don't owe you is cube sugar. <laughs> yes, Jack, I'll remember. 
Bye, Grandfather. Bye, Mom. Bye. Yes, yes. Doesn't this look Christmassy, though? It's wonderful to get an early start. Well, I'd like to begin to feel some Christmas spirit, Hazel, but with Paul upsetting me the way he is. Oh, but... look, Father. Yes? This is what we're giving Mrs. Kettleman. Isn't that a lovely old teapot? Yes, yes. And we got one almost like it for Claudia's Mrs. McCullough, see? Yes. And I've almost come to the conclusion that one of your children should talk to Paul. Why, I never see him anymore, and when I do see him... Oh, that's my phone. Yeah, I hardly ever see Clifford either. I thought this winter was both boys living in the family home with your mother... Pardon and... me, Father. Hello? I'd have some long evenings of good conversation. Yes? But I sit around alone all the time. Uh, Dan, where are you? Still at the Sky Ranch? Goodbye, Dad, they say, and they've gone out somewhere. Uh, Dan, just a moment. I didn't hear you. Say that again. Yes. Oh, of course, it must be beautiful up there. I see. No, no, I don't mind. Of course the boys want to stay. Well, when will you be back? Tomorrow? Oh, early Monday morning. I see. Well, of course, you'll have to leave about five o'clock. No, Dan, what makes you think I mind? Uh, hither and yon, to and fro, here and there, back and forth. Nobody stays in one place. What was that, Dan? I'm wrapping Christmas presents, getting an early start. Oh, no, Father's here. I have someone to talk to. Yes. Well, honestly, I don't know where you get the idea I'm upset. Have a good time. Bye, Dan. What was that all about? There we go again. So much fun up there, the boys want to stay the whole weekend. Oh, dear, I just remembered I've got a rib roast in the refrigerator. I thought it was a chicken. No, I mean here, the chickens at the Sky Ranch. I've got a rib roast for the weekend here and nobody to help eat it. Yes, yes, everything's all mixed up everywhere all the time. Uh, Father, why don't you all come over and have dinner with Margaret and me tomorrow? Why, I'd like that very much, but it's impossible. Why? You say all of us? Well, yes, Cliff and Andy, Mom and you, all of you. Yes, that's optimistic. All of us, indeed. Well, you couldn't capture Paul with the net. You'd have to lasso him as he sped by on his way to see Mrs. Christine from Freilich Abbott. A ten-pound rib roast. You might as well throw it out now if you're counting on Paul to eat it. Yes, open the lid of the garbage can, toss it away. He, he is in love. Yes, a giddy, gray-haired, middle-aged man. All right, I'll phone Mother about it. Yes, do that. Well, I think I'll go over to Claudius. Perhaps she can keep her mind on one subject, though I doubt it. However, I'll give her the benefit of the doubt and walk over to her place. Oh, that's okay, Claudia. Who wants cube sugar anyway? We usually have boxes of cube sugar up on these top shelves, Jack. I don't know why we're out of it now. Oh, forget it. Look out you don't lose your balance on that stool. Well, there's plenty of this other kind of sugar, granulated. Mm Mm-hmm. We've got that. Tons of it. Help me down, then. Nothing up here. You wouldn't think so, but our shelves are loaded with stuff, too. The only thing we ever lack is just something we happen to need at that particular minute. Don't let me fall now. Gotcha. (laughs) Yeah, you're pretty light on your feet. (laughs) Was I ever heavy? Nope, you never were, were you? I think Betty's gaining a little. Oh? Yeah, just a pound here and there, but needs some new clothes. You sure look swell, Claude. I'm kind of used to women that are gaining a little. Hmm. Nicolette's put on some weight, too, lately. Really? Yeah. About six pounds, I guess, or maybe seven. Some people, when they're unhappy, well, they go on absentmindedly eat something. Sandwiches and stuff. She really is miserable about Paul? Yeah. Hey, let me really look at you. You're positively skinny. You could be about 18 years old. <laughs> How could I? No, honest. Your figure hasn't changed a bit. Why, all my life, as long as I can remember, you've looked just the same. And pretty darn nice, too. Oh, what a nice thing to say to a lonely woman. I could say something else you might like to hear. Fire away. What? Well, when Rex Frome moved back here, there was a lot of gossip around that, that said, Now, watch Claudia. With Nikki away in England and her old pal Rex back in town, just watch for trouble. And? Well, you fooled him. You fooled him good. Maybe, Jack... Maybe after a few hundred thousand bumps, we grow up a little, you suppose? Maybe we know when we're lucky. I had a lovely letter from Nikki yesterday. Do you like to hear it? Sure, but I can't right now. You know when I left home to get cube sugar? <laughs> when? About two hours ago. 
Maybe he doesn't even know where I am. Well, you've run into unexpected hard luck. Yeah, tough assignment. You'd think a guy my age, a lawyer, ex-GI, father of six daughters, you'd think a guy like me would be able to locate some cube sugar inside a day or two, wouldn't you? <laughs> <laughs> Come and see me again, Jack. This visit was wonderful. Going home empty-handed, but I enjoyed it. Hey, what became of Margaret? Oh, she went off with Penny somewhere. Don't worry about her. I'll keep my eye on them. Okay. Hey, here comes Dad. He's certainly making the rounds this morning. Hello again. Hi, Dad. Yes, yeah, yeah. good morning, Claudia. I haven't got that cube sugar yet, Dan. Yes, yeah, yeah. Well, so long, Claudia. Bye, Dad. Goodbye, Jack. Yeah, yeah. Come on to Mickey's den and sit down, Dad. I was going to run over and see you today. Yes, you would have found me sitting alone somewhere, waiting for you. I had a wonderful letter from Mickey. I wanted to read it to you. Yes, excellent. Yes. Well, your house isn't all torn up with Christmas wrappings. I heard everybody starting early. I'm not going to feel very Christmassy this year with Mickey away. Well, wait, I'll get the letter. Oh, you can come over to the house and read it to your mother at the same time. Oh, it's such a good letter, I'd just as soon read it twice. Yes, have you seen Paul today? No, I haven't. I'm at my wit's end about Paul, Claudia. I want to discuss him with someone. I... Here he is, a grown man running after a widow he's known a few weeks at the most. But there's nothing but disaster ahead, Claudia. If he persists in going on in this fashion, uh, why, he'll find himself estranged from all the people who love him. Dad, don't you want to hear the letter? Yes, uh, yes, yes. Well, there was a time when Paul was interested in family things, like a letter and so on. My dearest Claudia. And now he wouldn't care to hear about London or anywhere else. My dearest Claudia. Nicholas means nothing to him. Family means nothing. His mother's health, my peace of mind, all mean nothing. I've never seen such a change for the worse in any human being. Oh, <clears throat> yes, yes, uh, let, uh, let's hear the letter. My dearest Claudia, cold winter rain is washing down my hotel windows, and my mind and heart go to California and San Francisco and Seacliff, and you, my dear, whenever I have a moment alone. I think of you with my first conscious thoughts in the morning, and you are in my thoughts and prayers when I go to sleep at night. Claudia, I think so often of how fortunate, how unbelievably lucky I was to find you and all the barbers. I'm afraid I hadn't realized until now how important the whole family is to me, how close Paul has been, Closer than a brother, really. Yeah, you ought to see him now. And Cliff and Jack. My brothers, really. My friends and my brothers. I love them all. It seems now that I must surely remain over here until after the first of the year. You know how my heart will ache for all of you at Christmas time. I'm sending a big box shortly. Gifts for everyone. The best that I could find in poor old England. And I trust it will arrive in time. Please tell Dan... Um, well, and then it's just things he asked Dan to do for him at Sky Ranch. But isn't that first part heartwarming, Dad? Oh, what are you doing over there at the window? Uh, Claudia, uh, Claudia, come here. Yes, what is it? Uh, look at that open car going by on this cold day with that woman in it, and that ridiculous, gray-haired, middle-aged man, your eldest brother, Paul, sitting beside her without his hat on. Huh. Nicholas talks of his heart aching why he's lucky enough that he's far away so he doesn't have to see a thing like this. Oh, Paul, I love it along the marina. There's a place to park right up there. We can sit and watch the boats by the yacht harbor. Here, pull right in here, Chris. Yeah. Oh, this is divine. <laughs> Your hair's all standing on end. <laughs> you know, people probably think we're mad driving around with the top down. Well, let them. Maybe we are. Or maybe they're all mad and we're the only sane ones, Chris. Or is there such a thing as sanity anymore? Don't feel bitter. I don't. You sure? You sound a little bit that way. Oh, well, I'm not really. No, Chris, I feel wonderful right at this moment. I feel free... Completely unfettered. No tension, no worry. Right now, nothing in the world exists but us in this patch of the bay. Those boats bobbing up and down there. I know. 
Isn't it nice to carve out a little piece of the world, make it your own for a while? Master of your own world, that's it. However small, however narrow, wherever it may be, if you can feel that you're its master, then there need never be any fear. But how many of us can do that? We go about our little worlds enslaved and fearful, afraid, afraid. You're not afraid, Paul. I wonder. No. You can never be really free. And if you felt fear, you'd overcome it. Oh. By meeting it. I think fear is only a monster as long as you run away from it. Once you face it, it's no longer fearsome or awesome because you've seen it for what it is. A bogeyman that has no reality whatsoever. What a remarkable person you are. You amaze me over and over. How is it possible that you, this beautiful, intelligent, desirable woman sitting here beside me, how is it possible that you were ever little Christine Froelich running past our house in pigtails with two front teeth missing? <laughs> I vaguely remember thinking what an ugly little girl you were. <laughs> and I remember you, not vaguely, but as my hero who came back from France wounded... I used to pray at night that your leg would get well and you wouldn't limp anymore. Well, anyway, not much. <laughs> Just enough so you'd still use a cane because that seemed so romantic to me. <laughs> <laughs> then here we are. And here we are. I'm still all those years older than you, but somehow it doesn't seem that I am. Have you brought back my youth or am I kidding myself? No. We're young, Paul, both of us. We shouldn't measure youth by the years we have. Let's measure it by the years ahead. All good years, youthful years. I believe you. And I'm convinced when I'm with you, but once back home, I begin to doubt again. I'll see myself as my father sees me. Middle-aged, a giddy fellow trying to recapture romance. Back in the world of reality. But that's not the real world, Paul. That's your father's world. You're worried about your family, aren't you? It's the inevitable hurt and misunderstanding. Hurt on all sides. You, everybody. You're being hurt in this, too. I know it. Paul, don't worry about me. Believe me, the little stabs your family have taken at my pride are nothing. My pride is very well scarred. It's not easy to wound anymore. Ah, uh, Chris. <laughs> Ah, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> well, we eat. Name a place, pretty woman. What's your mood, huh? Italian, French, Chinese? Oh, yes. Chinatown. Chinatown it is. Good. Some funny little place up an alley where nobody goes. Where nobody goes? How do they stay open? <laughs> you know what I mean. Some quiet, tiny place that isn't touristy, where it's kind of dark. You know, Chinese eat there themselves. Good. Well, we go home, brush up a bit, and I'll pick you up, ooh, round seven or so. Fine. Then we'll drive downtown, park, and walk up every alley around Chinatown until we find that place where nobody goes. How's that? It's a deal. Right. Furthermore, I love you. Oh, Paul. <laughs> hey, you better drive. I can't trust myself after that. I'll run into something sure. Paul? Yes, Mom? We're in here by the fire. Okay, come in. Well, you have been out in the wind. <laughs> Look at Paul's hair. <laughs> Hi, Cliff. Paul, you look half frozen. How are you? How about a kiss, huh? Uh, Why, your face is like ice. Your father says he saw you driving around in an open car. Yeah, we drove down along the marina. It was wonderful. This weather? Didn't you even wear a hat? What are you worrying about? If I'd felt cold, I wouldn't have done it. Why, sure, Mom. He looks as healthy as a horse. Look at the color in his cheeks. Yeah, foolhardy. 
What'd you say, Dad? Your mother is right. A man your age should wear a hat to say the least when he goes out in weather like this. Young people have more resistance. Henry. Well, I guess I'll get on my crutches and see if I can make it up the stairs to the top of the house. Your poor old man. Oh, poor. Decrepit. <laughs> Going out again tonight, I suppose? Yes. Out again tonight, tomorrow night, and the next night, and the next. Why wouldn't I? Oh, Paul, don't say things like that. If you'll excuse me, I'll go take a hot shower. It might stave off a rheumatic attack. It's another thing you have to watch out for when you get old. Henry, why do you persist in saying things like that to Paul? Huh? You've done nothing but pick at him for weeks now. I didn't pick at him. I told him the truth. Man his age riding around in an open car without a hat in December? Ridiculous. Dad, would you have given it a second thought if he'd been riding around that way all by himself? Huh? Sure. You'd have found something else to get sore at him about if you'd seen him riding by in a limousine, all wrapped up in blankets. Now, Cliff... Clifford, how in heaven's name can you be blind to what that woman is doing to Paul? Paul's not himself, Clifford. You must see that. Not around here, he isn't. How could he be with the beating he's been taking? Mark my words, too. He won't take it much longer. If he keeps on like this, you can bet on that. Huh? What did you say, Clifford? He'll take it just so long, and one of these days he'll quietly move out or run off and marry the girl. One or the other. I didn't understand what you said. Who got married? Nobody got married, Fanny. What's the matter? You're getting deaf? Well, Henry, if I didn't hear, I didn't hear. He, he was being facetious, Fanny. Uh, uh, rather attempting to be. Well, you needn't shout. I'm not that deaf. You're not deaf at all, Mom. There's just some things you don't want to hear because you don't want to face them. Why, Clifford? Hmm, is that any way to talk to your mother? Oh, sure. I'm sorry, Mom. I know, Clifford. Uh, uh, Clifford, where are you going? I think I'll go upstairs and talk to Paul if he has to leave. We'll be eating pretty soon, Clifford. I know, I won't be long. I just want to let him know that there's at least one member of the family who doesn't think he's giddy. Well, glad to see you, Cliff. Have a chair. You don't mind if I go ahead and get dressed. People don't seem to get up here to my studio lately, beginning to feel a little like a paria. Well, you haven't been around an awful lot either, fellow. You have to remember that. You didn't come up all the way here to tell me that, did you? Oh, hey, now, take it easy. Look, I'm on your side. Oh, I'm sorry, Cliff. I'm afraid I'm getting a little touchy in my old age. Oh, don't let all that stuff Dad's been handing out get you down, Paul. As a matter of fact, you're looking better than I've ever seen you. That gal's done you a world of good, and you stay right in there pitching, guy. If I were the sentimental type, I'd slop over a bit for those kind words. Thanks a lot. Oh, it's nothing to thank me for. It's the way I feel. I think the whole darn family's been giving you a pretty raw deal over this girl. I just want you to know how I felt. Yeah. It wouldn't be so bad if they knew Chris and then had decided they didn't like her. I could accept that. But they've never even met her. Not a gesture from anybody in the family. I don't care about myself, but that's mighty tough on her. Why should she be hurt that way? And she shouldn't, Paul. Of course, if it weren't for Dad, I think Oh, that... sure, Dad. But does everybody have to fall in line because he's decided not to like Frome? And because he doesn't like Frome, he transfers all his prejudices over onto the sister? It's stupid. I'd have been fighting back before this. Well, I don't want to hurt Mom by pulling out or anything like that. But honestly, Cliff, I feel as though I'm stuck any way I turn. This used to be a haven up here. Now it's like a jail. I don't want to come home. The whole atmosphere of the place depresses me. Mm, you're telling me? I can't explain it to anybody. Mom tries to be sweet, but I know how she feels. Look how she got sick the other night when I was over there. She wasn't sick at all. The minute I got home, she was fine. I don't mean she's doing it deliberately. It, it's just the old story. I, I've been around so long, she can't bear to think I might leave. Is that what Dr. Thompson said? Yeah, in so many words. Hmm. You know what happened a little while ago downstairs? What? Oh, I mentioned something about uh, that you might get married or pull out or something. She started getting deaf. No. She sure did. Well, there you are. Unconsciously, she'll keep getting things the matter with her. Oh, what a mess. I don't want to hurt her. I don't want Chris to get hurt. I don't want anybody to get hurt. Why don't you start getting selfish? Huh? You've been helping other people all your life. I'd start helping myself if I were you. You've just heard Chapter 10, Book 72 of One Man's Family... 
Written, produced, and transcribed under the direction of Carlton E. Morse. Chapter 11, entitled Clifford Defies the Lightning, will come to you next week at this same time. What's on NBC today? Entertaining comedy is yours when Phil Harris and Alice Fay drop around for another session of rib-tickling humor. And you'll keep right on chuckling when you stay tuned for The Adventures of Sam Spade. For today, Sam presents his most humorous caper of the year. Yes, great entertainment is yours today on NBC. So keep tuned here. One man's family came to you from California. And now stay tuned for the quiz kids who follow immediately on NBC. NBC.